Hi everyone, I am here to film a very exciting video today. I had hoped that by the time I sat down to film I would have said exciting thing to hold in my hands. It's supposed to have arrived before 12. It is now quarter past one and it has not arrived. But we all know that packages arrive when you least expect them to. So instead of peering out of my window, I thought I would sit down and begin to film this video in the hope that the doorbell is going to go. And if it doesn't, I'll film the first bit and then I'll insert some bits later. What am I talking about? Hi, my name is Jen. If you are new to my channel, hello, I am an author. I have previously published nine books. I have written these three non-fiction books for grown-ups. I have written this short story collection for grown-ups. I have published these two poetry collections and these three children's picture books. I am here today to talk to you about my 10th book, my 10th book. And I have never waited so long before announcing a book, partly due to excitement, partly due to logistics, but as I'm filming this, my new book is coming out in three months time, which feels very, very soon. I always get a little bit nervous when I make these book announcement videos. I think simply because there is a huge gap between writing a book and a book coming out, not just time wise, but also emotions wise. I feel like I always have to get reacquainted with my own books before they come out. We have to meet each other again. We have to have a chat, you know? We have to get to know each other once more and I have to learn how to talk about it in an external way instead of just being locked away in my bedroom and writing a book. So the first meeting that I had with my editor about this book was about two years ago. It's a book that I've been wanting to do for a long time and I've been working on a few different titles over the past few years, fiction, non-fiction, poetry. This one is fiction, but it does have a basis in, in research and there was a lot of research that I had to do, which was very fun and kept me company because I was writing it for a lot of last year. Um, so I think I'm always going to have a very interesting relationship with this book, given that it was by my side throughout all of 2020. This is a book that is for children, but also for grown-ups. We're saying eight years, nine years plus, just because it's a bit gruesome. So content-wise, eight, nine years plus, but it's the kind of thing that I really love reading as an adult. So I'm hoping that it's going to appeal to both young and old. So, shall I tell you the title of this book or shall I wait until the book arrives in the post? I think I might wait until the book arrives in the post. So that's gonna be a millisecond for you. Let's cut to that now. I knew that filming the beginning of this video would encourage the parcel to arrive. So the book is now here. I was gonna do a live unboxing, but you know, at the moment there's lots of hand sanitizing and sterilizing going on and it's just not very romantic. So I've saved you that. I've opened the parcel, we've cleaned everything and now I have the book here to show you. This is a special hand bound proof. In fact, there are two of them. And the funny thing is I don't actually get to keep either of these. I have them to film this video hug briefly and then tomorrow they're going to be whisked off somewhere else. One of them is going to uh, my publishing company, Thames and Hudson, and the other one is actually going to Neil Gaiman. Neil actually gets a copy of this book before I do, but that's absolutely fine by me. So this is my new book, my 10th book, and it is called The Sister Who Ate Her Brothers. And can we have a moment for the foiling? We all know that I love foiling, doesn't everybody love foiling? So we have this rose gold foiling on it and we also have this rose gold bookmark. This was going to be blood red and I don't know if, because it's a proof it's a different colour, or if they've changed it to match the foiling. Either is, is cool with me. We love a bookmark. So, the sister who ate her brothers and other gruesome tales. This is a collection of 14 fairy tales from around the world. If you are familiar with my YouTube channel and indeed my previous books, you will know that the history of fairy tales is my favorite subject. I love it very, 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 very much. How many varies? Lots of varies. I love it very much and I wanted to 
publish a book where I retold some of my favorite gruesome old fairy tales. So these are retold fairy tales. And by retold, I don't mean that I've set them in the modern day or anything like that. They have that traditional storytelling feel to them. It's just, I wrote them. And of course I changed some things about them too, because all storytellers do that. And I'm gonna read you a bit of the afterword in a second to elaborate on that. This is a book that is about 120 pages, I think, and it is illustrated by the wonderful Adam D'Souza. His name is here, where is he? Here we are. This is Adam D'Souza. Adam is a Canadian illustrator. This is Adam. Adam lives in Canada, so we have never met, and it has been wonderful watching him take my stories and illustrate them. This is not a picture book or a graphic novel, but it has color plates in because we wanted it to have that old fairy tale collection feel. I used to work in an antiquarian bookshop and I loved the Andrew Lang books, which I think were published by Longmans and Walter Cranes and all of the fairy tale collections that were published in the 1800s that normally were cloth bound. Can you hear that plane? He's gone. So they were often cloth bound and they would have color plates in them. So full color, full page illustrations. And those would often have grease proof paper to protect them. We don't have the greaseproof paper in here because it's not fragile, but Adam has done full color plates for each story. And then he has done line drawings for the borders on each page, which are so beautiful. So I would like to read you the very beginning of this, a little bit from the afterword, and then I'm gonna read you one of the stories as well. And also let me tell you where these fairy tales are from. Obviously there are hundreds of countries in the world and I have chosen 14 to include here, but we've got tales from Korea, Ireland, Japan, Norway, Nigeria, Egypt, Germany, Russia, El Salvador, South Africa, India, China, Spain, and there is an Inuit fairy tale in here as well. And going forward, if I do more of these collections, then I will include more countries. But immediately when you open the book, you have this, which is a book plate, and then you have the contents page and then this. What I really wanted was a narrative feel to this book so that it was as if I, or a narrator in general, was telling you these stories so that there is a wider context for each individual tale. So this is the beginning of the book. Hello reader. I can see you hovering outside in the dark forest. Come inside where it's warm, that's it. Just step over the threshold and close the door behind you. That's better, isn't it? I suppose I should introduce myself. I'm here to tell you stories. I adore stories, particularly the gruesome ones. There was a time long ago when these brilliant, horrible tales were known far and wide, but then people changed them. They gave them happily ever afters where nothing really awful happened and well, a lot of them became boring. So I want to revive those tales of old, the stories where things hide in the dark, the stories where people eat each other, the stories where there are holes in the center of the earth with terrible things inside. I'm going to tell you some of my favorite tales. I hope like them. I hope they please you. <laughs> you look a little worried. Don't be. You say the door has locked itself behind you. Yes, it, it does have a habit of doing that. Now come and sit down and listen to what I have to say. I'm sure once the stories are over, you'll be able to leave again. <laughs> I said sit. That's better. Are you comfortable? I hope not. <laughs> oh, we're going to have such fun. So after that introduction, we then have all of the fairy tales that I have retold with Adam's beautiful illustrations. Let me show you a couple of those illustrations. I really wanna show you all of them, but that kind of defeats the point really, doesn't it? So let me show you a couple. This is one of them here. Here. Here's another one. I love 
the use of colour when he does stuff that's under the sea. And I'm going to read you a story in a second where you're going to see more of the plates. So let me let me leave that there for now. So the afterword, I give context to the changing of fairy tales. Just, you know, obviously people are going to pick this book up who don't already know that that's the thing that I love most in this world. So just to add a little bit more context. So let me read you a little bit from the afterword. Not all of it because, you know, got to save some for the actual book, but to give more context to you as well, this is part of it. Fairy tales are slippery beasts born thousands of years ago. Historically, they were told via word of mouth, which is why they often have repeating elements, making them easier to remember. People told them over fires and in the royal courts, and they weren't just for children, they were for everyone. As they were spoken, the tales changed, they evolved like a creature. One storyteller would add one element, another would change something else. As a result, we can find variations of the same tales all around the world. For instance, oh, I'm gonna, then I was gonna say something about the actual stories in this book, but spoilers, so let's not do that. So then I go on to talk about the history of fairy tales in general. Old versions of Snow White have her mother, not her stepmother, dancing on hot coals until she dies. In some editions of Cinderella, her stepsisters cut off their toes and heels to try and fit into that slipper. And as for the little mermaid, well, in Hans Christian Andersen's version, she died. More recently, in the last 200 years, a lot of the gore has been removed from fairy tales to make them less grisly for children. Here, I have put that gore back in. You're welcome. I'm fascinated by the history of storytelling. In this book, I've collected 14 fairy tales from all around the world and retold them for you. Like any storyteller, I've changed certain things about them and then I've given specific examples, which I won't read here because spoilers. While I love studying fairy tales, I dislike how often they present evil characters with disfigurements to show the reader these characters should be feared. This is harmful and outdated and I especially feel this as someone with a disfigurement myself. This is why I am celebrating a princess with hair loss and a deaf man who happens to fall for a merman. In The Princess Who Ruled the Sea, a young woman who has her fingers cut off is not scorned or seen as monstrous. As someone with ectrodactyly missing fingers, I wish I had seen more of these stories when I was growing up. I also wanted to push aside the stereotypical descriptions of women in fairy tales, that they are beautiful or pretty and almost never clever nor brave. So there is only one mention of the word beautiful in this book, and when that word does appear, it is about a man. And there's more in the afterword too. But again, I won't read that because of spoilers. So yes, we have positive disfigurement and disability rep in here. And we also have some queer representation as well. And I'll probably talk about that more closer to the time, you know, how I chose the stories that I wanted to include, how I retold them. This is an announcement video that's probably already too long. I just wanted to share lots of things about it. It is my 10th book, baby. I am super excited to share this with you all. As I said, it's coming out on October the 7th. So in three months time, it will be available in the UK, in North America, in Australia and New Zealand. You will be able to get it at English language bookshops across Europe as well. I'm going to level with you. <laughs> Bringing out a book is always anxiety inducing, is it not? and authors always need their readers. But at the moment, authors need readers more than ever before. These past 18 months, authors bringing out books has been so stressful and it's why I have been shouting about new releases more than ever before to try and support those authors. So I have a big request. If this sounds like the kind of book, as I was telling you about it, and I will read you a story from it in a second, if this sounds like the kind of book that you would like to purchase when it comes out, I would love for you to pre-order it. Um, Pre-ordering is always important, but it's so important for logistical reasons right now, ensuring that the right number of books get printed for a start, that there are no delays in the printing process because there have been delays because of obvious reasons um, over the past year. And it would be so helpful to me if you could pre-order this book. You can pre-order it at your local bookshop online. You can reserve it at your library. Whichever way you would like to do it would mean the world to me. And I will leave links in the description box down below. This will be available in other languages as well. And I will put those on my website as and when they are announced. I think we only have the Swedish version confirmed right now, but there will hopefully be more in the future. Franklin, who's also published by Thames and Hudson, is available in 10 different languages. So fingers crossed, fingers crossed. Um, if you could pre-order and if you could spread the word, if you could share this video, if you could 
send pictures and blurbs and links um, for this book to people who you think might enjoy it, I would be so, so grateful. And as I said, I'm so excited to share this book with you. I did record a story from this book, which I'm going to insert here because I was doing that while I was waiting for this book to arrive. I'm sure that there are more things that I should have said, but I'm just excited. And we have time for me to, sh to um, say those extra things later when I remember and stop word vomiting at you. But this is happy word vomit. Stop saying the word vomit. It's a new book. How exciting. <laughs> i tell you what I'm going to do, actually. I've just remembered that around September time last year, so just before London Book Fair, my publisher asked if I would do an audio recording of one of the stories that they could send to foreign publishers when we're seeking translation deals for the book. So I had such fun sitting in my bedroom in the dark. I think it was late at night and I had a blanket around me to try and make the sound a little bit better quality and I read out the title story of this book which is The Sister Who Ate Her Brothers which is a Korean fairy tale and then I added in sound effects because why not? So that is something that I did. I love reading out fairy tales. One, because I think it harks back to the traditional nature of storytelling and passing stories down via word of mouth. But two, I think it kind of heightens the creepy. I think it heightens the creepy. And when you get this book and you, and you look at it, you will see that it's framed as if someone is telling all these stories to a reader. So if you fancy reading them aloud to yourself or to a friend or to a partner or to a child, then, then I would very much encourage that. So I am going to leave you with the audio recording of me uh, with sound effects reading out the title story from this collection. And uh, yeah, I'm going to share that story now. The Sister Who Ate Her Brothers There once lived a farmer who had three sons but no daughter. His sons brought him joy, but he still wished for a girl. He wished hard. He wished upon the moon. He wished for a daughter at any cost, even if it meant she was half girl, half fox. Nine months later, his wife gave birth to a girl with a tuft of orange hair. <laughs> this baby sniffed at every surface. She dug holes in their garden. She growled at the butterflies. All seemed well. When their daughter turned six, the farmer's cows began to die. They fell one by one by the light of the moon. The wife peered into the night. There must be a wolf, she said. The farmer agreed. He beckoned to his eldest son. Stay outside and keep watch tonight. So the boy sat outside until sunrise and he couldn't believe what he saw. When the morning came, he hurried to his parents. He told them he'd seen his sister take the form of a fox. He said she'd pelted through the grass, tackled a cow to the ground. Then she'd pulled out its liver and swallowed it whole. <coughs> How dare you, cried the farmer. I've never heard such lies. You must have been dreaming. Get out of my house. On the second night, the farmer sent his second son to keep watch. So the boy sat beneath a tree and he couldn't believe what he saw. When the morning came, he hurried to his parents. He told them he'd seen his sister take the form of a fox. He said she'd sprinted over the hill, jumped onto a cow's back. Then she'd wrenched out its liver and swallowed it whole. <coughs> What nonsense, cried the farmer. You're as mad as your brother. You're copying his lies. Get out of my house. On the third night, the farmer sent his third son to keep watch. The boy sat by the cowshed, but he was very, very tired. He fell into a deep sleep and saw nothing at all. When the morning came, he hurried to his parents and told them a lie. He said he'd been awake all night long. He said he hadn't seen his sister. He said a cow had died of fright when it looked at the moon. Finally, his father sighed. Here is some truth. Meanwhile, the two exiled sons wandered down the road. 
Under the midday sun, they came across a Buddhist monk. They told this monk about their fox sister and asked if he could help. Take these three bottles, the monk said. They will help you on your quest. Now, go back to your family. Go back to your home. The brothers took the three bottles, one red, one white, one blue. They harnessed the wind to hurry back home. But when they got to the farm, no one was there. No one, that is, apart from their sister. She was wearing an apron and held a knife in one hand. I've been expecting you, she grinned. I've cooked us a stew. The brothers followed her into the kitchen, for the smell was intoxicating. We must remember they had walked far, and they were both very hungry, so we shouldn't judge them for sitting down and eating that stew. The three siblings ate. They chewed and they slurped. They swallowed and they burped. When their bellies were full, the two brothers fell asleep. The house was so quiet, for no one else was home. The farm was also quiet, for all the cows were gone. Nothing could disturb them. Not a thing. And yet... The eldest boy awoke in a panic, his heart howling. Something was very wrong. He turned his head to the side and felt his skin turn to ice. There was his sister in the form of a fox. She was bent over his middle brother. His liver was in her hands and there was blood on her chin. In the moonlight behind the sofa, he saw the bones of his parents and youngest brother. The white of their skeletons glowed in the dark. I've been saving you for last, big brother. His little sister laughed. If I eat one more liver, I'll become fully human. I won't be a fox. I'll be a real little girl. The eldest boy ran. His breath heaved in his chest. He ran past the dishes, realising what had been in the stew. He bolted out the door, speeding into the silver night. Not fast enough, his sister giggled, just three steps behind. He reached into his bag and pulled out the bottles. Take this, the boy cried, throwing the white one first. It billowed into smoke and formed a thicket of thorns. Not strong enough, she cackled, clawing her way through. Take this, the boy yelled, throwing the blue bottle. It transformed into a river, blocking her path. (laughs) Not wide enough, she taunted, swimming easily across. Then take this, the boy bellowed, throwing the red bottle. It burst into flames and consumed the fox whole. There was no response this time, as the fire had engulfed her. His little fox sister was no more than Ash. Thank you for watching this video. As I mentioned, all the links are in the description box down below. If you could share this video far and wide, I would love you forever. I am so excited to introduce you to this book properly in the autumn and sending lots of love to you all. Bye.